has also given some space for not only Indian institutions to internationalize, but also for foreign universities to have their presence felt in the Indian geography. Well, that's not the background for our conversation, but just to set the context, it's always been a dream for many students uh, to go abroad for higher studies. So that's one of those ambitions that many of the students nurture right from their schooling stages. And given the fact that they are interested in pursuing education outside India and predominantly higher education, traditionally India has been one of the single largest contributing nations in terms of number of students going abroad for higher education. China being the number one country and India a close number two. So I just want to begin this discussion by just giving a very small statistic. In the year 2000, when you measure global mobility of students by way of number of international students studying in different countries, the top five countries that hosted international students was uh, the United States of America, United Kingdom, France, Germany, and Australia. And then in 2020, the top five countries, again, the United States of America, UK, new entrants were Canada, and then Russia, and Australia. But France and Germany still had a significant share of the number of Indian students coming. Another interesting statistic is, for example, Australia, you know, amongst the total number of students studying in Australian universities, close to 32% of the students are foreign nationals, which means, you know, the total number of student population has got significant international uh, community of students studying in Australia. And France and Germany also, not in that large numbers, but a significant population. So the statistic clearly says that international students in foreign university campuses is one kind of an experience not only for the students but also an engagement model for universities in different countries. So let me begin this discussion by requesting all the three consul generals from France, Australia, Germany to have their opening remarks on according to them what do you think is the key differentiator that attracts Indian students to your home universities. So in any particular order, I just leave it to you. You can decide who wants to go first and then your opening remarks, please. There, there were three reasons which brought me here today. First one is ADU is a very renowned conference on education, on higher education. Second one is, I have arrived here in India only seven months ago, and what I, am, what I have noticed and what I, I'm stunned about every day still is this ambition to learn. So I meet almost any, everybody I meet wants to learn, and the kids want their kids to learn and to get a better education and a better life. And the third reason is, when I was a student, I had the chance to study abroad for one year, which was at the time when I did my studies in the early 80s, not a very common feature, especially not in, in law. So thank you very much for, for inviting me here. Um, well, why should you study, why should you come to Germany and uh, study at a German u university? You said that Germany wasn't among the um, five first ranking uh, countries. Um, yes, but Indian students in Germany are the second largest group as foreign students. 
and they're about to overtake the largest group, which are the Chinese students. I'm sure that during this year, India is going to overtake China, not only population-wise, but also in the number of students in, in Germany. Last year, it was 35,000, so I hope we'll scratch the 40,000 this year. So why should you study in Germany? It's a country with, one says, a difficult language, there are winters, uh, the climate is not very, very nice, but Germany offers you the possibility to get a foot in the international labor market. German universities are quite renowned. And they're and all state universities, right? I mean, they're public most, most of them are state universities, so we have 106 universities, 216 universities of applied scientists, 21,000 study programs and 1,600 MA and BA programs in English language. So you can study in Germany without knowing German, but I think you should know German because you're going to miss a lot if you don't. And I leave it at that. Okay. Hi, thank you very much for having me here. I'm Sarah Curlew, I'm the Australian Consul General for South India and uh, thanks to the Think Edu conference for putting together this session. I'm really pleased to share the stage with my distinguished colleagues. Um, a bit of a competitive pitch, I guess, which of, our, which of our countries you would like to study in and I just hope that Australia does better here than we're doing at the cricket in Nagpur at the moment. Um, I think, you know, this concept of global knowledge partnerships is really important and um, you know, my, my colleagues, I feel I have to acknowledge that many Australian universities will also have links with French or German counterparts. So actually we are talking about a global education system these days. I actually wasn't aware of that global stat that Australia um, is in the top five for receiving countries for international students. Uh, and I, I'd like to put that in the context for all of you that Australia has only 43 universities. Uh, seven of those universities are in the global top 100 and roughly 50% of them are in the global top 200. And Australia also, sorry, it's majority state uh, public universities, right? Yes, yeah. that's correct. Uh, so, you know, when you come to Australia, you are entering a very internationalized education system. We have around one lakh Indian students studying in Indian universities. And um, for us, you know, our Indian community is such a valued part of our multicultural society. We now have around a million Australians of Indian origin, and we have a population of just 26 million. So you can really see what a welcoming place Australia is for India. If I come uh, specifically to the kind of strengths of our education system, I've spoken to you about the quality. Our universities are very good in general. Um, also, there's a value proposition there. So students who go to Australia have work rights while they're studying. Uh, you have post-study post work rights, and that can be between two and six years. And under the free trade agreement we just signed, uh, there's an extra year again for Indian graduates of a STEM, that's a science, technology, engineering, or mathematics subject. Uh, there's also some very generous scholarship schemes, and my government just announced a new Maitri scholarship scheme specifically for Indian students. Uh, in terms of the kind of post-study relationship, so we also know that some people will, might choose to stay in Australia, but many will come back here and put their skills uh, to good use. So once you've maybe taken advantage of that post-study work right and you come back, we want to maintain the relationship with our Indian students. So we have something called the Australian Alumni Grant Scheme, and I was pleased to sort of announce the opening of the next round of that last week. Um, and we also work very hard with the Indian government on qualifications recognition. So we know you want to be able to take a qualification in Australia and work in India and indeed vice versa in terms of that internationalization. Uh, the only other thing to talk about perhaps is the lifestyle in Australia. Uh, you will all be familiar with our outdoor lifestyle, our pleasant climate. Um, I've spoken to you about now what a large Indian community is in Australia, which means that there are temples and mosques and vegetarian food available. Uh, it's a very welcoming place for Indians. Uh, and it's a very safe country, and I know sometimes people have concerns about that, but I can reassure you, Australia is a safe place. More than 50% of students in our universities are women, uh, and most of our universities are in our kind of larger cities. Okay. Uh, if you want any more information on studying in Australia, there's a good website you can look at, Study Australia, just Google that. But yeah. thanks very much for your time. 
Anakam, good afternoon. So thank you very much for the ADU conference to have me on, on the stage with my dear colleagues. So I would like to make a couple of remarks and then to give you three main reasons to come and study in France. So first of all, France has a very special and long relation with India, dating back to the 18th century. That gives us a lot of strong ties, historic, cultural, and even family ties, especially here in the south of India. You may know that the two-thirds of the population of the French Réunion Island in the Indian Ocean are of Tamil origin, from Tamil Nadu and Pondicherry. So we have about two like Indian citizens living in France with Tamil origin. So we are already uh, well connected with a long history. We are celebrating this year 25 years of strategic partnership, uh, which is a very high ambition of bilateral relation. And education and culture is one of the five strong pillars of this uh, strategic partnership. We built uh, academic cooperation between uh, our two countries with peer-to-peer uh, -peer relations and uh, university agreements between French University and, Uni and Indian University. And here in Tamil Nadu, we have 102 MOUs or agreements between French University and universities of Tamil Nadu. I will just take one example, which is the IIT Madras, one of your best uh, IIT in India, connected with an agreement with the University of Paris-Saclay. And you, have, you may know that Paris-Saclay is ranked at the uh, level 16 in the Shanghai uh, ranking for the, like the global ranking. And if we look at physics, Paris-Saclay is ranked nine. So our uh, University of Excellency are connected with yours and uh, we build on that to create uh, university programs, double degree. We have a very uh, dynamic double degree between the Sorbonne Paris University and the University of Pondicherry on economic and administration. Yeah. So we have double degree, we have MOUs, and of course we have student mobility. Yep. So um, we had almost 10,000 Indian students studying in France pre-COVID in 2019. And the objective set by the, our president, President Emmanuel Macron, when he met Prime Minister Modi, is to upgrade students' mobility from India to 20,000 by 2025. So for us, it's a, it's a huge challenge, but there's a huge potential, and especially in the South and in Tamil Nadu. So we build on these uh, university agreements, and we also have a communication campaign and a scholarship program. So the French government has opened um, a scholarship program for India with 12 crore every year for scholarships of, at any kind of level, including a PhD mobility. And so why to come and study in France? I'm gonna give you three main reasons. First, um, and might already have guessed, France is one of the leading nations in academics, research and innovation. I mentioned the, rank, the ranking of paris Saclay University. We also have a couple of other universities well ranked. And we are uh, among the top Nobel Prizes winners and uh, Mathematic Medal Fields, Fields Medals winner. Actually, we are the second nation with the highest number of Mathematics Fields Medal. And we, lost, we, la we won it last year with uh, famous Professor Hugo Dominil Copin, who won our 13th uh, medal, Fields Medal. And uh, last year, we also got a Nobel Prize in Physics with Professor Alan Aspect and the Nobel Prize of Literature with the famous writer Annie Ernaud. So top level, um, <clears throat> top level quality of education is the first reason. Second reason is that studying in France, it's not so expensive. It's a reasonably priced university, thanks to the number of public and state-funded universities. The, the French state covers almost all the cost of the study for students, French and foreigners. So that's uh, affordable and good quality.
For an example, uh, foreign students spend less than 4,000 euros a year for a master degree. And the final reason, as in Germany, you don't need to speak French to come and study in France. We offer more than 1,600 curricula completely taught in English. Okay. First for our own students, because we know we, we need to speak English and French, but also, of course, open to foreigners, because having foreign students is a chance for France. Uh, we consider education as a public good, and we, the state government is putting money into it. So, and we welcome Indian students. We have very high ambition to welcome more Indian students and also to send more French students to India. Yeah, Thank I you. was about to ask that. Landry. Yeah, I was about to ask that. I think you have enough reasons to study in any one of these countries. Huh? And given the fact that you have a target to double by 2025, and you're also hoping that uh, the Indian students will be outnumbering the Chinese hopefully next year. And this is not a surprise because, uh, you know, uh, the post-COVID, uh, actually the uh, number of Indian students leaving India to pursue higher studies has, as a percentage, increased while students from China leaving China for overseas studies has fallen down by 9%. So in absolute numbers still, Chinese students are more, but in terms of growth, we see large number of Indian students. So uh, your target is achievable, but then we need something special. The reason is the occasion is special. India is now, you know, the uh, G20 presidency nation. Now, during this time, uh, how do you think uh, with the growing number of Indian students coming to universities in all these three countries, uh, how do you think you will be better prepared and make sure that you know, students are given some, I'm not saying special privileges, but they feel, because today, this morning we had a session on how education has to be student-centric, learner-centric. So what are some interesting learner-centric uh, initiatives that the universities in your home countries uh, will be able to offer for foreign students and more particularly to Indian students? Well, I would say one, one advantage of the German education system in general, not only at universities or, or universities of applied sciences, is that they very well combine theory and practice. So if you want not only to have uh, an academic education, academic studies, but also want to, to try in practice what you have learned at universities, then you're very well placed in, in, uh, in a German university. So that's a, a huge hands advantage. On. You get that hands-on feeling. Exactly. I mean, especially in the universities of applied sciences, but also in a, in a let's say, put normal universities, even in, in, in a matter like I studied law, at, even during my law studies, I went to court and I had, for, for a period of a month or so, I had to work at court or in a, in a, in a lawyer's uh, cabinet uh, to be able to pursue my studies. So that's clearly one advantage. And um, I, I would also say you can continue that work because you're a, getting a work permit while you are studying and even when you have finished your studies, you can, without any break, you can continue working, uh, working in, in Germany. Okay. Anything? This, that's STEM? Any non-STEM? I mean... Yeah, I mean, I like this term, what is it, learner-centered education? I mean, surely that should always be true. I, I kind of can't think what education that is not learner-centered would be in the modern world. Um, and I do think that these kind of connections between study and work are very important and, and likewise our universities take them up. I want to take a slightly different angle on answering the question. Um, as India has relaxed some of its education policies, we've seen Australian universities coming to India with some really quite innovative degree options. So um, that might be a two plus two model where mm -hmm. someone studies for two years in India for two years in Australia and then graduates with a degree in the name of both institutions. Mm -hmm. And so that, you know, it can be cost effective, it can mean a student can spend the first half of their degree close to home, getting settled into the university environment, but then still have that overseas and international experience as part of the degree. 
Um, another model, uh, University of Melbourne, which is one of our best universities, they worked with the University of Madras on an undergraduate science curriculum. Okay. So students here in Madras can study the University of Melbourne science curriculum. And then, of course, if they want to go to Australia for, say, master's level education, there's a very seamless transition. So I think increasingly we see universities looking for those learner-centered options that are also around how do we structure this to make sure students can get an international experience and also an Indian experience. You want to add something? Maybe complementary to what uh, Michael has said about Germany. Uh, first of all, we have a bilateral uh, agreement of uh, academic qualification recognition between France and India, so you can cross from one system to the other with official recognition of your degree. Uh, second, uh, like in Germany, uh, with a student visa, you can have, um, you can do internship during your studies. Most of the French university include a period of time of internship in the degree. And, and the visa also al allow you to apply for a first job opportunity after graduation. And of course, um, students are looking for good job opportunities back home in India. In India, we have more than 500 French companies. And if we talk only about Tamil Nadu, we have 170 French companies or Indian French companies doing business here. We have our two major automotive uh, companies here hiring more than 3,000 uh, employees each and not mentioning Saint-Gobain with the largest uh, glass factory in Asia. So there will be job opportunity and this company will look for students graduated with the two culture or intercultural experience, uh, international exposure, and that makes the difference. And of course, uh, the knowledge of several languages is also a plus on the labor market. Thank you. My last quick question for just I need a quick answer before the students can ask their questions, is, uh, you know, I'm sure you're aware of uh, another policy that's in, in the draft form available in the public domain on allowing foreign universities to set up campuses, establish their campuses uh, here in India. So you want to take a shot at that. How do you see that as an opportunity? Or what's the readiness level amongst universities from each of your countries? Not necessary. all of you have to answer. Maybe you can choose whoever wants to take this question. Yeah, this is a huge opportunity uh, for all universities, but uh, for French universities as well, because uh, many uh, French universities already have campuses abroad, but not in India. We have representative of French institutions, French colleges, French universities settled in India to, who are running double degrees or exchange program or uh, university cooperation program, but no abroad campuses in India, so I'm sure they will work on it. Like um, I graduated from the um, Institute of Political Sciences of Paris, which is called Sciences Po. Sciences Po already has uh, campuses in Singapore, uh, so I'm sure India will be a uh, uh, a potential opportunity because many Indians come and study in Sciences Po. Uh, I had an alumni uh, meeting, alumni meeting with like a, a dozen of Sciences Po graduated only in Tamil Nadu, so mm -hmm. if you consider the all of India. Like the French business school called INSEAD have a, a network of uh, 500 alumni yep. from, uh, from India and they are looking for opportunity to settle a campus in India. Yeah. You want to answer? Yeah, just to add that I know our universities are looking at these opportunities very carefully and actually it's a very positive signal that it sends, I think, for the appetite of India and Indians for higher education, right? There's just enormous demand for skilling and um, we haven't really talked about the skilling component, but that's also something where we want to work with India on the future skills, the industry-led skills and how can our training institutions also partner here in India. Okay. You also want to yes. Yeah, well, uh, actually our universities don't have such a tradition on going abroad. What we do or what we did in, in two cases I know of is to found together with the host country universities like we did in Budapest or in Istanbul, German-Turkish University, German-Hungarian University. 
On the other side, research institutes, which in Germany do the bulk of research work, they have a tradition to, uh, to have, uh, to, to, to go to foreign countries like Fraunhofer uh, Association, which is present here in India. They are really doing research work from four companies and uh, this is something uh, we Exciting. do. Okay, so we have time for just two quick questions, except for a visa, please ask any question. Recently, UGC approved uh, foreign universities to participate in India. One concern raised by many authors and writers was that uh, universities uh, coming from foreign to India are not interested to do the capital investment and they expect subsidies from the local government to establish all the infrastructure. And uh, they will just send out the uh, standards and uh, syllabus and all those things. Uh, so, uh, is there any plan from France, German or French to bring in any, any of your reputed universities to India? And what I think is that your they, that's what they answered. With the government. That's what they answered. Uh, there is some interest level uh, from France and Australia and from Germany, a different model of engagement, though not, not necessarily a campus presence. There are, for example, IIT Madras, when it started, had the first hand-holding facility from Germany. So, they are interested in some... Uh, such uh, research engagements in India. So that question was answered. So you have any other question? I'm just making your life easier. Yeah. <laughs> My question would be, where can I get written information on all of that has been said here? And we leave, I think all of us are going to leave link lists or information that is available here with the organizers of this conference and you can address yourself to the organizers and find out more about the possibilities of, of, all, of, all, our, of all the places. Okay. In that case, I'll ask the last question. In that case, yeah, uh, any of you can answer this. Now, how do you think, uh, you know, as institutions, uh, we should prepare ourselves to encourage students from your countries to come and study here? So that's also internationalization. So there should be reverse mobility. So how can students come here? So we have um, a program called the New Colombo Plan, and the Colombo Plan was quite a famous scholarship scheme that took students to Australia, but the New Colombo Plan is funded by government to bring Australian students to India to study. But what I have observed uh, in my time here is that often the first connection is a personal one. Some researchers know each other, someone has traveled, met at a conference, and I think for us to develop all of these links, it's incumbent upon you as university administrators to maybe travel to our countries, get to know people, and likewise for our universities to come here, which they do do very actively, and that can build those partnerships because I think there's great enthusiasm on both sides. Thank you very much. And yeah, yep. I have one last. Maybe it would be also interesting to have Indian university to promote their activities in our countries also to attract yeah. the students where they are. Yeah. And um, linked to that, I want to mention we're going to have a French education fair in October in Chennai called Choose France Tour. Mm -hmm. So come and visit us. Yeah. In fact, for the benefit of those academics, uh, oh, now I see a lot of student hands and I feel so sorry. Uh, but anyway, I don't want to disappoint that girl. Okay, please, quickly. So is there a possibility that you can set an online uh, where you can attend courses from here instead of setting uh, a facility here? I mean, it, it can take a lot of time. So. Okay, the UGC draft regulations prohibits online uh, presence, but they have their own certificate courses available in various edtech platforms like Course, uh, That's right. right. And so for Australia, you can undertake part of your degree online from here because you're enrolled in the Australian university. You'll graduate from an Australian university having completed some time on campus. So that's possible. But as you say, it's not kind of involved in bringing the campuses here. But maybe I'll just close with one interesting piece of information for uh, academics, faculty and uh, leadership from institutions. There are many initiatives from the government of India side the Gyan program, the Spark program, DSTs, Vajra. I mean, these are initiatives where the government of India, the Ministry of Science and Technology, uh, the Ministry of Education, they are funding these international collaborative programs to promote academic relationship through research, through various types of engagement. And these are things that can actually internationalize and increase uh, physical presence both ways 
faculty and students fully funded by the Ministry of Education, the Department of Science and Technology. So please uh, use that opportunities as well. And a big round of applause to all the three who have shared a lot of information. And they definitely have a lot of information available in the public domain. Please fully utilize them and get benefited out of that. Thank you very much. Thank you.